result of being on the west or northwest side of uh, a seamount, you know, that they have greater nodule fields. Can we um, There's a go, fish. go back and take a look oh, at... Yeah. Oh, yeah, fish first. Go to the fish. Okay, getting the fish. Seen enough Roger. of those. Elusive fish. fish. Corals don't move very fast, but the fish, yes. Go for zoom. I'm not in my best fish flow here. I haven't had enough practice this dive. Okay, see if you can get his little little face. All right, I think it's a cuskio. Very bouncy. Nice job. Tough to tell without getting a good shot of the lateral line. What's that? I, I think it's a cuskio, but we uh, it's tough to t really tell the difference between certain groups without looking at the lateral line. Okay. We don't have to chase it down. Um, at least we got a little shot of it. Uh, but to the back and to the right, there was another thing I wanted to look at. Okay. Uh, there was a dark kind of yeah. fan-shaped object. This that thing I is super cool. Dark fan-shaped object. Oh, yes, down and to the right. Maybe. Um. No nope, piece of rock. Oh, up on top here. Okay. Oh. This thing. Uh, the ship's just about to finish a move, so I'll just let it hold yeah, position while we great. do watch change. That looks Eocles like it's just up. the rock. Oh, yeah. Steve? Uh, science? Yep. I Th think that's just thing? rock. Oh, oh, that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's just the rock. That's a midwater rock right there. <laughs> a midwater rock. We found it. This is actually a pretty neat thing if uh, this is turn, turns out to be what I think it is. Okay. Let me see if we can turn it out to be that thing. That's that's what I'm thinking. I think it might be the first one we've seen so far of the cruise. Yeah. We just found a neat thing. I think it's a black coral. Uh, but we're just going to zoom to confirm and then. Can we get yours. a zoom? Heteropathies. Okay, go for zoom. Are we still calling that Heteropathies Americana? Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Strange collection of polyps there at the base. Yeah, that's interesting at the very like fleshy. stalk. Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. Huh. Hey. It's All really right. pretty. Oh, yeah. that's good. I can't believe you spotted that. Good point that to was end amazing. on. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we are, we are edging towards our watch change to all of our viewers, so give us a minute while we kind of switch things we over. We can just keep the zoom there, possibly. Sure. I'm going to leave it right there. But thank yeah. you for viewing, and we will. this watch will be back in a, Hold position, about eight please. hours.
Hello. Is anyone around? Just kidding, everyone's getting plugged in. Testing. Oh, that's too loud. Looks like Team Blue Water is actually going to get some sea bottom action today. So stay tuned. We're going to start introductions in just a bit. Okay, zoom in, please. Yep. What are you? Oops. Hi. Mm. I'm here. It's a oh. cucumber. Zucchini. They're pretty. Yeah, that's nice looking. Look at his little spike back thing. Pretty color. Now, isn't that fun? I, feel I like, like we these get guys. Into our accent door conversation again. That'd be a nice accent door color. I really mm -hmm. like their uh, their little skirt. It's yeah. called a vellum. All right. Be a good color for a convertible. Looks like a benthodites. Or for a licorice ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this upside down? <laughs> they, they gave up on mousing. Do not mouse. <laughs> mouse is broken. Upside down. All right. Do we want to go somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see. See where we are in the world. Oh, we're going to that. Where are we going? We're going to the top of the mini oh, mountain. Mini mountain. Hmm. I know. Nope. It was me. You're Herc. Um. So science just charging up the mini mountain. Yeah. Yep. Let's uh. Let's just keep going. All right. Let's keep doing what we were doing. 
We're getting to that almost exciting depth, so oh, let's exciting. get there. Let's go. We've got four not, hours. Not that it's not exciting already. Just... I'm not excited right now. <laughs> well, you should be more excited. Okay. Check this out. Oh my gosh, there's some... Do you see that? No. There's nodules. <laughs> <laughs> That's Whoa. crazy. We've never you seen those before. You know what? It's it's better than blue water, guys. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. Anyway. <laughs> All okay, you salty is, pants. No, yeah. this is actually Lovely. great. I'm, I'm just making a joke. This is lots of fun. Yeah, Trevor, watch out. We'll end up in blue water again. <laughs> uh, all right. How about uh, one six four? Um, are you feeling big steppy? Big steppy. All right. Uh, five zero big enough. You went bigger. Seven four. <laughs> seven eight. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the bridge. Okay. Bridge nav. Can we get a five zero meter step bearing one six four? Correct, thank you. Oh, yep. Uh, looks like transfer speed is point two knots. Yep. You want to go faster? Bridge nav. Um, I'm sorry, can we also increase transfer speed to 0 0.4 knots? Yep. Thank you. So we are in, what, our 12th hour? of the second dive for the uh, Lu'ua Ea Hiki Keiku Alunakai Expedition. We are exploring unnamed Seamount G near the Chautauqua Seamount that is named. It's, it's the only named Seamount in the chain. And we'll start introductions in just a moment. All right, right now in view, um, we have a couple corals. We have Norella macrocalyx and Romilla gorgia militaris. So that is the small three um, branched coral in front and then that really nice lyrate looking coral in the back. So we've seen a number of these during this dive at this depth. These seem to be the two major species of corals um, that are around here. As we make our way up slope, we're expecting to see a lot more different uh, species of coral, uh, a lot more diversity, hopefully more animals, more excitement. We've got to get our pilot the, excited. This is the militaris? This is the macrocalyx. Ah. Yeah, Norella macrocalyx. Uh, they call it macrocalyx because the um, little scales on the bodies of this polyp are are really large. So even zoomed in, we can really make out those nice little scales. Um, Norella right. has three scales on each one of its polyps. And then when the polyps close, they close in a downward direction. So that's how we can identify that genus in particular, and then that species. How does a coral exercise its back by doing polyps? <laughs> oh no. Oh my. Is there any benefit to closing upward as opposed to closing downward or just something that you see like being left or right handed? I, I think it's something like being left or right handed. Um, it's just the way that those scales on the body of the polyps are um, structured and it's just the polyp can only close in one way, one direction. Um, and it would be bad if they were closing in opposite directions 
on the same colony just because they would bump into each other. So they all close in the same way. And that can help protect the polyps of the coral if, say, a predator is coming by. So you'll notice that um, polyps on the corals will, will close up, say, if uh, Hercules takes a sample, just because that colony is now disturbed and the animal wants to protect itself. And tentacles are nice, delicious things for animals to nom on, so they like to pull in their tentacles. So something like a sea star that eats the polyps, uh, would retracting the polyps actually protect the coral against the sea star? Or are, we protect, are they protecting against different predators? Uh, that would be protecting against different predators. Uh, if you are a coral and you're being predated on by a sea star, the sea star actually extends its stomach outside of its body, wraps it around the branch of the coral, and then uh, digests it there. So the coral really has no chance. There's not much escape in a stomach, is there? Nope. Looks like there's an interesting sponge up ahead. Yeah. yeah. Let's go see it. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Can you zoom in, please, and keep some suspense here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I can't see the top? Not yet. Suspense. So <laughs> much suspense. Well, we do like to see the base of uh, our sponges and corals to see how they're attached. It looks like he's wearing a bow tie. And I'm looking at the <laughs> dictyonal <laughs> framework of this coral, and that's sort of the way that these um, the this, uh, spicules are coming together to form a structure. And so, here is the osculum, or the opening of this coral that we're looking in. It has these nice spicules. You can see these like little lines. Is that the ones sticking kind of straight in towards the middle of the circle? Yeah, those are a single spicule. Wow. Looks like something out of an alien movie. Yeah, so the little shards of glass. Don't stick your hand down in there. You hear that, but. Hercules? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Corvitellini. Um, that is a subfamily of the family Euplectellidae. Wow. And so this is a very soft sponge. It's similar to the one that we collected uh, first thing this morning uh, when we reached bottom. But this one is probably a different species. Are there any creatures that like to make their homes inside of that opening there? Oh, I'm sure there's a bunch of animals that like to hang out inside here. Sure. I think there was a shrimp down below that was uh, just sort of chilling with this sponge. That shrimp might use the the sponge as, as a refuge. And since this one doesn't have that sieve plate over the osculum, uh, animals can come and grow freely. You also see uh, polychaete worms or bristle worms. Uh, in sponges quite often, um, sometimes hydroids, uh, crinoids will use sponges as perches. So sponges make a good habitat for a number of different types of animals. Speaking of digestion, unfortunately, um, Ooh. someone has validated Is Trevor's... Uh, oh, go ahead. I just saw this track and I was wondering if that is the the oh, fellow the that made maker. the track. Yeah. Go ahead and zoom in the track maker. Good catch. Oh, yeah, there it is. I'll get a little closer there, Aaron. Little snail buddy, sounds like it. Yeah, these ones are really gorgeous, but they're hard to get good video of because they look so fuzzy, and that's just the way they look. Their, their foot, which is this uh, outside part, is really translucent. So this is a slit snail, it's a, like a limpet. Is it going around cleaning the sediment and eating that? It is, yeah. So it's it's cleaning out that sediment and uh, leaving these trails. But, you know, it's really hard to find them. So I'm actually pretty impressed that we've seen, yeah. seen a few of these today. I've seen those tracks a bunch, but I don't think I've seen the that snail. Yeah, and exactly. The track connected. Good We've job. definitely to zoomed on a few tracks to hope to see the snail, so that was that was a really good view. Sure, five zero meters, one six four. Yep, please, thank you.
So I will not go into detail. Trevor, one of your fellow Canadians, uh, has vindicated your hagfish slime egg white idea. What? Why are we talking about this again? And provides oh, wait. examples. <laughs> wait, sorry. I, I, I only heard half of what you said there. Uh, I won't go into detail, but one of your fellow Canadians has vindicated your hagfish slime as egg whites idea. Oh, good. And listed examples. And that will be the last time we talk about it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm kind of curious. No, no. <laughs> I will not go into details. Okay, maybe, maybe you can screenshot it for him later. Yeah, I'd love to <laughs> love to get some recipes. Will do. <laughs> you guys are so gross. The real question is not the details. We can skip the details. But has this person tried it? <laughs> I don't believe so. Ooh, oh, good, well good, good. Doesn't count unless you try it. It's pretty cool topography in Argus view, the little <laughs> ridges. Yes, Aaron, I'm changing the subject Aaron to science. Is done with this. <laughs> you see, in, also in Argus, there's a hagfish. <laughs> it would be really cool if we saw a hagfish. It would uh, be very cool. We don't see them that, that often. You know, there's a hagfish day. No. Yeah. Do it's every day. How, how deep have <laughs> they been? How deep have they been found before? Like, what's the deepest? Um, I'm actually not sure, but they are found pretty deep. I definitely think we, we could see them at these depths. But look at that Argus view. Looks like it a layer cake. Nice, yeah. It's, it's really cool. cool. So little plateaus, steps. That was the fourth thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this morning. Which reminds me, remind me to take the trash out when we go down. Well, not yet, but I don't, I don't want to hit that spot. <laughs> Question from the chat. How old are these corals approximately? Well, we just got here. We haven't dated anything yet, have we? Um, yeah, uh, how old the corals are, that's a, that's a hard question for the ones that we were looking at. Um, I'm not exactly sure if those specific corals have been studied, um, but deep sea corals do grow extremely slowly. So we're looking at, you know, quite a long lifespan for a lot of these deep sea corals and corals that are of significant size are often hundreds of years old. For example, um, black corals have been found to live over 2,000 years, some species. And we have seen a few black corals today, and uh, we just saw some primnoa corals, the norella, and a chrysogorgic coral, the Ramula gorgia militaris. One, six, four. Okay. I got a wee bit of current pushing me to the left, which I guess would be a easterly current. So, back row, what are we on the lookout for right now? More rocks or something? Always rocks. <laughs> what are you okay. going to do with all those rocks, Coralie? I'm going to study them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Do some science with them? I'm going to do some science with them. Nice. 
And and then build a wall with them? Actually, I'm hoping to make my house out of them. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I have like a really nice rock garden. Trevor, are you okay for a zoom on Argus? Yeah. Aaron, can you zoom on Argus, please? Can we look at that thing? What is that thing? That That's what I want to know. It's what sticking out it? of the sediment, so it might be a sea pen. Zoom in, please. Wow. The same color as the sediment. Oh, it's heaving. Yep. So this is a sea pen, Thanks. and it has a um, a basket star on it. That's a star? Yep. It is a star. Looks like a knot. Cool. Do we know any more than sea pen? Like, can you get, does it have a species name? Uh, yeah, it's really hard for me. Uh, I don't really know the sea pens very well, unfortunately. And uh, the ones that live in the sediment are e even more difficult, especially the white ones that look all the same. So I, I don't have a better ID for that, unfortunately. Okay. We, but that um, that uh, basket star, I believe we have seen something like that before. Can you come up on Delta, please? Roger. Bio sampling question: Is there any benefit, or can we get any um, information from collecting uh, dead bits of coral and sponge? Unfortunately, dead bits of corals um, aren't going to be very informative, or dead bits of sponges aren't going to be very informative, um, just because uh, they're dead, so they might have lost some of the spicules that are important to identify them. Um, dead corals can provide sure. some really uh, interesting uh, data for us, especially if we have the base of the coral. If we can find a dead base of a coral, we can then date that coral, find out how old it was um, when it died. And that can be pretty informative to science. You can also use isotopes in order to understand some other uh, changes in the ocean environment over the history that that coral lived. So uh, say a coral that lived 2000 years could give us a little bit of a snapshot of the environment uh, when it was alive. What kind of isotopes? Um, probably some stable isotopes could be useful. My roommate, the one with the mucus, studies <laughs> compound-specific isotopes on coral reefs. So you can find out where they are in the food web, which is pretty cool. So I, I went and looked up that um, that basket star that we just saw on that uh, sea pen. I know I'd seen it before, but I couldn't remember its name. Uh, it's Asteronix Love and I. Oh, I love that. Yeah, isn't that pretty? I love an eye that. <laughs> I'll remember that one from now on. So when uh, doing biosamples, um, how do we deal with temperature and pressure changes when bringing them back? Well, there's not much we can do about the pressure. Um, we would have to build a special capsule uh, to put the animals in if we wanted to keep them at the same pressure, which isn't really useful to us. Why is that not useful? Uh, well, I mean, it would be useful if you wanted to keep the animal alive. Um, but since we're planning on preserving them, uh, it's it's just not worth the effort to to put them into a pressurized chamber. Um, we we do do our best to try to keep the animals cold. Um, if they get warm on ascent, they they start to degrade a little bit. So it's really important to bring them up as quickly as possible. Try to keep them cold if we can't preserve them right away. 
Hercules has a little built-in refrigerator. We throw them in. Yeah. Now the big bio boxes do retain the water that is collected at depth, and so that helps keep our our specimens cold on our long ascent to the surface. They're like an inch thick of plastic, I think, which is a good enough insulator for the time of ascent and sitting on deck. Let's check out this bathopathy. This All is right. a type of black coral. Now, sometimes if we zoom into the center, you might see a little ahead, um, zoom. a little polychaete worm hanging out. I think right she's in between. The center. Let's go up a little higher. Yeah, so the main axis sometimes hosts a, a polychaete worm, but not always. Yeah, I don't think this one has one. Worm free. All right, come wide, please. Are the worms typically using it for food or protection, or why do they typically have one? Uh, they always seem to hang out right there in the middle, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they're using it as a habitat, as a protection. Oh, what's that? Oh, I gotta go. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a sea cucumber. Looks one like of those it. really dark purple ones. Yeah. Oh, there's another good sea cucumber. Oh, is that an enemy? We can zoom in on this. Uh, go ahead, zoom. I'm processing, Aaron. <laughs> oh, yeah. It looks like an anemone. Okay, come wide. It's nice and fast. Um, science row. So, question for you. How sampling intensive do we expect the next little while to be we're trying to adjust our speed of the of the vessel so we can accommodate sampling while also balancing getting there eventually so what's the what's your expectations here yeah so the next rock sample i would like to take would be at 2570 meters okay next water rock pairing and then i don't know for bio what they want oh it's whatever we find um Okay. So I, I can't really tell you until sure. we see it. That's great. So we got to be on the lookout for bio on uh, on occasion. And then the next rock sample won't happen for another 300 meters or so. Yeah. Would we get that on this summit? Will that be? Okay. Those are 10-meter contours. Cool. Okay. So no rocks for the next little while, but opportunistic biological sampling. Roger that. Yeah, we're still a little deep, so we might find something really interesting, and there's just never knowing what you're going to find. Right. But it, I did like the pace we were going yesterday afternoon, so. Afternoon? Or morning, yesterday morning. It's all the same, right? Yesterday the morning. Was that with this watch? No. Yeah, well. I don't remember. Maybe. I don't know. It's all boring <laughs> together. It's all the same now. Yeah. <laughs> yes or now. This is dive two, and we've already lost all sense of time. Yep. <laughs> the blue water doesn't help because that feels like it goes on forever. It, it does go on forever. It does. Who's to say we're not still in blue water? Wow. I mean, the we water are in water. <laughs> the rocks are just making it uh, less blue. Yeah. Someday you will realize there is no rock. What? <laughs> Have you not seen the Matrix? What's this white thing? Can you zoom in on there? Um, no, I have never seen the Matrix. Everyone what? is really surprised that I haven't. Um, what? What are those? Oh, look at this little hymenaster. This is a slime star. Aww. Oh, it's so cute. Okay, come wide, please. Bonk. I nice almost thought it was a cucumber for a moment, but then I saw it was not. Almost the same color as some of those cukes that we've been seeing. So we're not looking to sample a cucumber until we uh, get to the summit of the seamount. So that won't be until probably tomorrow morning. Yeah, we could do another move now, I think. Okay. Bridge nap, another five zero meters, one six four, zero point four knots.
question is, what are those long straight things that look like branches or cactus skeletons? Probably talking about the corals, I'm guessing? I think, are they like uh, sponge bits or something that are now coated? I don't know. I see them too, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, the, the things that are the brownish uh, things laying on the seafloor, that's all dead sponge material. And we've seen quite a few really large uh, dead sponge material uh, things, I, as I was watching earlier. Um, it looked like a dead uh, Faria sponge, those, uh, those big gramophone-looking sponges laying on its side. And it, it was all dark brown because it collected a bunch of sediment. So when corals and sponges get to be of an extreme size, sometimes the current can topple them over. Which is why you don't see like massive, massive sponges and corals unless they've really adapted to spread out. That's a tragedy since yeah. they grow so slowly and they finally made it to that size. And then one day you just fall over. That's how it happens. Now they don't die immediately after they fall over. It can take quite a bit of time just because you know life at these depths is so slow uh, but eventually the the sponge or the coral will simply pass away uh, we got a question from a few minutes back there's a little red organism on the left side of the screen I think we we're zooming into the slime star a shrimp? Um, that could have been another one of those basket stars that was living on a sea pen. I've actually been seeing quite a number of those after we saw that first one. I saw a shrimp on the left side of the screen. Yeah, I thought it oh, was it could have been a shrimp. Shrimp shaped, but it could have been, you know, a star mimicking a shrimp. Well, I have to remember what it was, which red thing, it you was, know. <laughs> I saw a shrimp just to the left of that white star we zoomed in on. If that's what the person's talking about, yeah. that was totally shrimpy. That was shrimpy? I mean, could be. I. We saw other red things, too. There though. are a lot of red things. Like, sometimes it's uh, brittle stars on corals. Sometimes it's shrimps. What color is that worm we were looking for on the black coral? Um, They're, they're usually, like, a, a grayish color, okay. grayish-white. So if we do see some really sizable scale worms, uh, that's one of those things on our collection list. Scale worms. Yeah, they're like good size polychaetes, bristle worms. And they're called scale worms because they have little scales on their back. Sort of like a, a fish scale. So I'm seeing a bunch of like sponge stocks. So this is a sponge stock that has a bunch of brittle stars on it. We have time for a quick zoom on it. Go ahead. And this sponge stock doesn't look super recently uh, deceased. It's still white in color. Hasn't collected a lot of sediment. Did the top break off of it? Yeah, it looks like the top broke off of it. And it can't do any filtering through the stock. Is that right? Uh, not that I know of, no. Poor guy. The stars are going to town. Yeah, the stars really do like it. Now, uh, I mean, the sponge might be able to regrow the top of the sponge. I'm not sure, but I have seen some cases where the little head of a caliphacus is really small. Uh, in proportion to the size of the stock. So one theory about a sponge like that is that the, the top was removed at some point, but then grew back. So it's not impossible. But we also don't really know if that's the case. Question for some long-time explorers. Have you ever explored any caves or caverns? Or at least come across them? Fish. 
well. Oh, bye fish. Bye fish. We were on um, some cave hunting around the Channel Islands for a couple of years in a row, um, where we saw some small, small caves. Um, we were trying to pick them up with the sonar and then explore with her. But we didn't go inside them with it's this with little the thing right here. A little micro black coral, maybe? Yeah, it might be a black coral. Zoom in on that, please. I don't know if I can get very close. Let's see what I can do. Oh, you're right. Look how cute it is. It is really cute. This could be a heteropathies. Yeah, so I know it's a heteropathies because it's got branches coming out from the center axis in addition to the one long ones on the side. Isn't there something, too, where the, the branches come out at the same point versus staggered? Mm-hmm. Can't remember how that goes. Yeah, so some bathypathies are alternating and some are opposite branching. And they're both bathypathy? Uh, some are... There are bathypathies that are alternate. There are bathypathies that are side by side. Cool. And then there's the heteropathies that looks similar, but it's got extra branching. But black corals are really hard. Sometimes you have two things right next to each other that look the same, but they're actually different. Um, and a lot of the characters are microscopic, so you've got to like zoom in and see the like, bumps and features be very difficult to tell them apart in video alone. Pop quiz for you, Megan. Are you ready? Okay. What is a coral? What is a coral? <laughs> All right. Love well, it. a coral is an animal. And if you, strictly speaking, most often uh, corals are a colonial animal, though there are exceptions to the rule uh, of being colonial, like uh, cup corals are a single polyp, and they work together in their colony to survive. So a lot of people think that corals might be plants, um, just What's because they, right they look kind of plant-like. Ooh, pie. can we check that out this thing? guy? This guy? Yeah. yeah. OK, zoom in there, please. Oh, it's a cuke. Yeah. That's a very spiky cuke. Looks like a Onira Fanta. So this is one of the ones that uh, Liz Miller at the University of Hawaii was looking for. You got more zoom? Um, Do you want to sample she, it? She's more interested in uh, animals that near the top of the seamount as opposed to this depth. Um, okay. Is this? Oh, that's not the top. That's just a false summit. Oh, this is a little bum. Oh, yeah. okay. We're, we're a million okay. miles from the. Top. Yeah, but if we do see this later on, um, that'll be helpful to her study. Uh, we want to. She wants to collect a bunch of animals from different depths to compare to the abyssal plain samples. Cool. Just so on one of oh. the depths that you know hasn't been collected from is is something shallower. Roger that. Uh, we got a couple deep ones yesterday, so. We're going to try to get some shallower ones for her. But just sort of pointing it out, just in case we see them later on and I miss it. From afar, I thought that was a sponge. It, yeah, it kind of looked a little spongy, didn't it? Mm -hmm. It's also really useful to annotators if we uh, zoom in on things that are new to the dive. That way, you know, kind of have in your mind what types of animals you might see. Sometimes it's hard to identify something from far away without um, getting a good view at least one time. AKA helpful to you in the future. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm just definitely looking out for myself too. You, I'm a, you I'm see a how fan. Let's zoom in as much as you want. <laughs> Seems are really helpful. These old dead sponge carcasses look like it those looks uh, cool. rubber mats. Yeah. Zoom oh, in on the yeah. sponge carcass a sec. <laughs> and then while we're at it, there's a black coral just above. Oh, wow. Yeah, it cool. looks like the bottom of your shoe. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, someone was walking around. Where was that black coral? 
It's just right above. There it there is. It is. Oops. Whoa. Oh, whoa. Hello? Easy does it, Trevor. There we go. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that looks like a trisopathies. All right, thank you. Oh, we're gone. Got a couple of uh, associates, but I wasn't able to see what those were. Probably some really fine, small, brittle stars. Iconoderms seem to be quite uh, abundant in these types of areas. We see a lot of variety of iconoderms, brittle stars, snake stars, sea stars, sea cucumbers, urchins. Got a question from the chat. Uh, the dead uh, uh, oh, my brain shut down. Uh, the dead coral snocks that we keep seeing. Um, would you consider those a fossil or just a carcass? Um, so the dead sponge stocks, uh, I wouldn't consider those fossils. Um, but if we were on, um, say, a geo, a flat top seamount that had previously been above water. It likely have old fossil coral reef on top, and so those would be considered fossils. Or, or paleo corals, it depends on who you ask. Or rocks. If you ask me, they're just rocks. Everything's a rock, really. <laughs> if it's not currently alive, it's a rock. Rocks are alive in their own special way. Right? Right? Well, let's ask the geologist. Do you have any theories on why we're seeing so many stalks in this area? From current, maybe? So many socks? Stalks. Well, one theory would be that up higher on the seamount, there's a lot of really cool stuff, and it's just fallen down slope. And uh, that's what I'm going to be hoping for. I like that theory. Yeah. Is it ever possible that like a large organism can come by and just kind of like brush everything over? I mean, that's possible. Uh, I've definitely seen some fish take out some corals on accident, uh, especially fragile corals like uh, the hemichorallium. Uh, there was one dive, a coral got startled, or not, a fish got startled by uh, the vehicle, and uh, it just sort of flipped around really quick and swam straight through a hemichorallium, and it just shattered into little pieces. So it is possible for animals to uh to, to knock over corals or sponges uh, but we're not going to see too many animals of significant size down here that are going to be taking out those really big sponges or corals this associate on this guy Ooh. are we Urge. I think it might be a crinoid a 
Okay, go ahead and zoom in, please. Looks crinoidy. Yep. Sure is. Is that the same as a feather star? Yes, a feather star. Oh, and it has a little uh, snail on it. It has its own associate. Yeah, it's got its own little associate. Wow. Cool. Okay, thanks. So many sea friends. <laughs> sea friends. Friends not just, forever. Not just associates, they're friends. Do we have any ideas as to why corals and sponges have evolved to be so fragile? Well, um, you wouldn't necessarily evolve to be fragile, nice. yeah. but if, say, there is such little chance of you being disturbed, there wouldn't be that um, pressure to construct a stronger skeleton um, to reduce the chances of you being damaged. So in the deep sea, you're not really getting extremely high currents that are going to be damaging to corals. Um, so that's why you're not going to see uh, that the really large pink corals in shallower water, uh, just because, you know, they could be easily damaged. But down here, they might not be. So there isn't that pressure to, to be a strong uh, coral skeleton. It doesn't mean that the skeleton isn't strong. Uh, it is it is pretty strong. It can hold up to quite a bit, um, just not a fish swimming through it. Um, other corals uh, have extremely strong skeletons, like uh, the black corals, for example. Example, um, they tend to be very wiry and and very strong. That's why we have coral cutters on our manipulator arm uh, to help snip off samples, because otherwise it would be very difficult uh, to grab a piece of that coral, it really holds on quite strongly. Holds together very well. The uh, base is usually the weakest part, I think. Yeah, Just usually the base the will, will give way first uh, than the actual skeleton. Uh, but a lot of these corals are, are too big to put in our bio box, so we only need a small piece, and, and we don't want to take more than what we need uh, to identify that animal. But of course, sometimes the base can be really informative, um, how it attaches uh, to the substrate. And that's why we like to get some good zooms on uh, the basis of some of these corals and sponges while we're down here. Can I make this better? You can make that better. Okay. I'll, uh, here, let me find something to zoom in on, though, then we can make it better. Okay. Hold for a sec. Is that a star or is that a piece of sediment? That is a star. Let's have a look at that while we do operational stay still in this. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. There's two of them. So they went off to the right. So this is a brittle star, an ophioroid. And uh, taxonomy of, of some of these ophioroids okay, can good. be... Thanks. Pretty challenging, um, and identifying them just by looking at the top of the animal can be hard. Uh, one of the main identifying features is actually uh, the mouth parts on the underside of the animal. And uh, you can't just ask your sea star or brittle star to just, you know, turn over and uh, let us see your mouth parts. I just love that term, mouth parts. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that so funny. Yeah, they have these like little like teeth, and uh, you can identify some families by the arrangement of those teeth, how many they have, and and what they look like. Cool. You're also looking at the scales that are along the arms, which can also be quite difficult to see unless you're looking at them under a dissecting scope. Earlier we were talking about sea pals. Um, when you say associates, um, 
What's the difference between like a symbiotic relationship and a parasite? Is that is an associate more of a symbiotic relationship then? Um, so I say the word associate uh, because I don't want to make the assumption uh, that these are commensal organisms or parasitic organisms that are on top of the host. So uh, just to be more general, I'm just saying uh, associate. There is an association between these two animals and it's not always immediately obvious what that relationship is. And uh, just to not give anybody wrong information or, or make things up, um, I'm trying to use a, a little bit of a broader term. I like it. Bridge nav, another five zero meters, bearing one six four zero point four knots. So Coralie, we are scaling another sea mount in this chain. Are you seeing any uh, significant differences between the uh, geology of the two, just by visual identification? Not a bunch. I mean. All of the crests have the botryoidal texture. This one seems to be seems to have a lot more sedimentation than the previous one, if I am remembering correctly. Um, and I feel like we saw a lot more biology um, than we did at our last dive. Definitely more biology. But I want to talk rocks. I don't think we did official introductions for this dive, but um, we are at the moment surveying sea mount, unnamed seamount G near the Shautaka Seamount, which is just uh, south of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Right now we're at about 2,700 meters depth, and we're making our way up the slope. ROV question, how long can Hercules stay under the water at one time? Is there a limit? Depends if he's been practicing holding his breath or not. <laughs> um, no, not really. The limiting factor is usually when we run out of science or dive objectives. Um, that's usually the, usually the limiting factor. Fill up all the bio boxes, take all the niskins, fill the slurp jars, or run out of sea mount. We get to the top. Those are usually the things that end a dive. So on this cruise, we're doing approximately 24 hour dives because that's an appropriate amount of time to cover the seamount and fill up our sample space. Um, last cruise, we were filling up stuff faster and doing more around the 12 hour mark. But uh, I think Hercules' longest dive is 74 hours, just over three days.